This week on Quality Digest Live, we explore why quality professionals must lead the digital transformation for manufacturers. That's right. Plus, do U.S. employees still go above and beyond at work? Well, we'll find out when we come back. If we feel. <music> And welcome back to Quality Digest Live for April 20th, 2018. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. That's right, and I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. Have you heard the term last mile delivery? You familiar with, mm -hmm. with what that is? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, for those of you who aren't, last mile refers to that last step, the last transport, the last handoff when getting a product from point A to point B, from let's say the manufacturer to the customer, from mm -hmm. the distribution center to the customer. And believe it or not, that last step, that last mile in the delivery process is sometimes the hardest and the most expensive, believe it or not. Now, according to Frost and Sullivan, about two-fifths or 40% of the overall logistics costs are associated with that hmm. last mile. 40% for just that last little bit and to get in that package into your hands, 40% of their, their logistics costs. Thousands, sometimes at 10,000 miles to get something from somewhere to somewhere else. <laughs> and and the and last mile. Is that, that last mile that eats up the majority yep, of it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and it's all of this is for forcing providers to come up with newer, innovative solutions to deliver packages, particularly within cities. And delivery models are changing. Uh, Frost and Sullivan predicts that the market will rapidly move toward mobile freight brokerage type on-demand deliveries and autonomous technology, such as the use of drones and delivery bots, autonomous vehicles, that sort of stuff. And they say that uh, these may solve the last mile delivery challenge by being more cost effective to end users and with less regulatory mandates. I'm not sure about that last bit because we'll see how unregulated <laughs> drones and autonomous vehicles are, yep. but you get the idea. It's, it's this proliferation of e-tailers and the customer's need to get all of their products that is now changing the way we look at logistics. It's not just get it all to a, to a big box store and then the customer goes there. No, the customer wants it in their own hands. Yeah. Now, further trends and develop, developments driving uh, this last mile logistics include digital freight brokering platforms reducing empty miles by eight to 10%. Now, empty miles mm -hmm. is a big deal for logistics companies because mm. what that means is driving a truck that has no freight in it. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not good. You want no. you want all your freight to be paid for. Yeah. So when a, when a driver or a truck has to deadhead hauling no freight, that isn't any money for the company and it's also less money for the drivers. So you oh, want your trucks to be you know 100% utilized if you can. So this looks like it might reduce those empty miles by eight to 10%. Mm -hmm. Also, a shift toward low emission and zero emission solutions, such as the use of low carbon vehicles or bicycles. Oh, yeah. We're also looking at fleet operators. These last two are important. Fleet operators expanding their strategies by developing urban distribution centers and coupled with that, retailers focusing on compact stores to reduce capital expenditure and bring products closer to their growing urban base. Now, what's interesting about this, if you think about it, a long time ago, or well maybe not all that long ago, even 100 years ago, you had all your little shops in your little neighborhood mm -hmm. and you went to your little neighborhood shop. And then supermarkets came out and then big yeah. box stores and now you drove to get to your big supermarket or your big box store so you got lower prices and that sort of stuff. It's now going the other direction. Right. It's like, no, we need brick and mortar and we need to get them closer to the customers because the customers don't want to drive 30 miles to a big box store, mm -hmm. they want that widget delivered right into their hands and they want it right now. Mm -hmm. So now the model is just kind of almost flipping back the other direction yeah. if you think about it. So what all this means is, a, is, is the customer, as usual, that's in the driver's seat. Customers get more and more products online and they want them now and they want everything. So. You know, when you say the customer's in the driver's seat, <laughs> it's very literally true. Logistics, for, yes. for, yeah, for the, for, the, for the retailers or the e-tailers, 
they want the customer in the driver's seat because they can go pick it up as opposed to having to deliver it right. to them. So it's like exactly. the customer being in the driver's seat is actually what they want. So yeah. I mean, and, and the customer's <laughs> going, I don't want to drive anywhere anymore. Right. I want my, I want this this little five dollar item mm -hmm. or three dollar item that I ordered on Amazon and have free delivery. I yeah. want that to come to my doorstep. Well, and it's gonna. I mean, eventually yeah. it's going to because you know as we talk about these autonomous drones and things. I mean, eventually, yeah, we we've already seen them that Amazon's right. developing this in some of their huge warehouses where you know a drone picks and packs it, right. flies through the roof to the place right. where it's going to deliver it, drops it on the front door, boom, that's it, it's done, right? Yeah. And hopefully it doesn't get shot down. Well, <laughs> who knows, who knows. All right, well talking <laughs> about the impact of the digital economy in logistics, yeah. before something gets shipped, it's got to be built. And manufacturing has seen a huge growth in digital technology as well over the past decade. Uh, we talk about Industry 4.0 many times on this show. Manufacturers can now use and are using purpose-built technologies that give them the ability to do more in less time and with more control and with more understanding of what their process or processes are doing. It's a form of process improvement uh, so that we can do things better and faster while reducing risk, all enabled by this digital transformation that we are seeing in manufacturing. And this is critical for our audience, quality professionals need to be an integral part of their organization's digital transformation. And here to tell us why, and a little bit more, the digital transformation is Frank Defesh, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Viva Quality One. Hi, Frank. Hey, Dirk. Hey, Mike. Good to be here. Hey, good hey, to see you. How are you doing today, Frank? I'm doing well. Well, let me, let me start with this, Frank. Uh, you start your article by explaining digital transformation uh, with uh, kind of a lighthearted analogy that maybe you can kind of share with, with us and with our viewers. Yeah, yeah. So in today's world, new, new lingo gets invented way too much. You hear new terms all the time. And, and most times, that new lingo gets interpreted differently, creating confusion and miscommunication within and across companies. So to, to get people aligned on the definition and goal of digital transformation, I find a, a relatable analogy that everyone can understand works best. So let's take the timeless example of a teenage boy going out on a Friday night, and let's focus on that worried parent at home, worrying until they safely get home. So 25 years ago, that parent waited by the phone for their son to call them from a payphone. 15 years ago, the teenager had a mobile phone and the parent called them typically over and over. Uh, <laughs> five years ago, the teenager had a smartphone and the parent would text them, where are you, over and over. Now today, that peer parent simply pulls up an app on their phone that shows exactly where their son is on a map as they take a sigh of relief as they calmly say, Siri, tell me when he leaves. <laughs> so that, that is a pure example of digital transformation, much like the logistics uh, transformation you were talking about. You know, technology or innovation that changes an old way of doing things to a new and improved way of doing things. But then technology or innovation comes out that creates yet another new way of doing things and the cycle continues. It's the same objective. I'm a worried parent, I wanna know where my kid is but there's continuous improvement to make that objective easier to achieve. Now, as, as we look at this, as, as we translate this over to the manufacturing realm, and we're seeing, as, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Industry 4.0, the di digitization of manufacturing, you say in your, artic in your article that quality is just as accountable or needs to be just as involved in, in this digital transformation as the IT department is. So why is that? Well, you know, the operative word in digital transformation is transformation. That's the power. Uh, transformation meaning change. Technology, aka digital, without related process changes and proper change management will not deliver the outcomes your company expects. Technology is advancing so fast. It's, a, it's almost a runaway train. The quality professional needs to serve as the conductor of that train so it operates safely and gets to the right destination on time. Now, all companies are going through digital transformation from finance to marketing to manufacturing and every function in between. It impacts and in enables improvement in all business areas. If your partners in IT leverage technology innovations without working hand in hand in quality, they can introduce risk and you can veer off course. Without IT understanding the systems that quality defines and adjusts and why those systems are the way that they are, IT will lack the guidance to, to really drive value. Now, IT just doesn't have the product, 
process or compliance awareness that the quality team does. Now, the other reason is that IT and quality are the two departments that can positively impact the full product life cycle, which begins with product innovation or ideas and extends to the customer experience. They really are kindred spirits. Often you hear this referred to as industry 4.0 or quality 4.0 or moving from little Q to big Q. Digital transformation connects things that happen in product development to things that happen in manufacturing and suppliers and all the way to the brand, the branding claims and the overall customer experience. And the quality team is the most knowledgeable and the best person to manage that change. You know, that's what the quality role is, is managing change. And this is, this is why they're accountable. And, and, and I should mention that your name is not Russell Morrison, your name is uh, <laughs> it's Frank Defesh. We have the wrong caption up there for you. No. We'll, we'll, get that, we'll get that fixed. I, uh, I can go by Russell. <laughs> we're, we're, we're speaking to Frank Defesh of Viva right now, not Russell Morrison. Um, so can you give us an example, you just described qualities invo involvement. Can you give us an example of a company where you're seeing quality play a more active role and, and what, are, what, what kind of impact has that made? Sure. Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, quality needs to have its footprint across the entire product journey. Um, it's, it's just critically important. One of, our, one of our customers was suffering from what many customers suffer from, information being stuck in siloed applications or in different spreadsheets and emails and different people's inboxes. And this problem caused them an issue that hurt their brand reputation. The R&D teams that create the product, the suppliers of the material for the product, and the marketing team that makes the claims about the product have no shared visibility or traceability because they're working in different systems. So as a result, marketing made a claim that the product didn't have a certain sensitive ingredient, when in fact it did have that ingredient because somewhere between product formulation specification and the supplier, something didn't go right. So after some pretty heavy public backlash, the, the company embarked on an end-to-end -end digital transformation initiative led by the quality team. Now today, this company is using Viva Quality One uh, to provide a single source of truth between product formulations, suppliers, and marketing claims. Now how? Well, because they're all working in the same system. It's one cloud application that everybody can enter in so that you're taking all that information out of email and out of, out of Excel spreadsheets and putting it into one system so you have full visibility and traceability. And that's both internally and externally with their suppliers. And so that, that's, a, that's a key key element of all of this is if you have a digital environment, all that digital information has got to be shared in some way. So, and it's easier to do that now than it was before. Before you might have to be sending pieces of paper around to people, but in a, in a sense, there, the new digital environment actually, if you get it set up, is actually provides a fairly Simple, for lack of a better word. I know the technology behind it isn't simple, but I mean, it's all, it's all ones and zeros. It's easy to zip stuff across to other platforms for people to have instant access to them in ways that weren't possible before if they lend themselves to or, or get on board with this type, of, uh, this type of technology. Would you say that's probably a, a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, email and in spreadsheets, you know, that's still digital, yes. but email and spreadsheets means there's no single source of the truth and there's no shared visibility. I email you something, then somebody else emails it and say, okay, this is version 2.0 and 3.0. Next thing you know, everyone is looking at a, a different truth, which means there, no one's looking at the truth. And you guys, you guys have a, a conference coming up, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, we're having the Viva Quality Summit. Um, the summit will bring together IT and quality professionals together to apply a sharp focus on digital transformation and how it applies to everything from the plant floor, supplier quality, and through all the thousands of moving parts that relate to the brand promise of your company's products. It's a it's a complimentary learning event. It's not promotional. And, and when uh, is it? It's, it's June 5th okay. in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. Um, and Viva's investing in this event to really help expand the role and skills of the quality professional. As the world advances, so do the profiles of certain trades or professions. So for example, um, a marketing professional, 20 years ago, they didn't know, need to know about social media or online search advertising. Today, if you want a job in marketing, you need to have those skills or you're not getting a job. For quality, while managing CAPAs and non-conformance inspections and supplier quality management, those are still core job skills. But the expected skills of the quality professional in today's world are much broader. 
technology is paving the way to improve those processes in material ways. And you know, as I mentioned, the future arrived yesterday, and it's time for us to all gain the skills and perspective to adopt manufacturing te technology suited for today's reality. Now, this summit will feature speakers who are thought leaders from both quality and technology. Um, some are featured on the registration page. Um, attendees will include quality and IT professionals of very small suppliers all the way to Fortune 100 uh, manufacturing companies. And to learn more about the Quality Summit, uh, people can visit quality1.viva.com or email us at info at quality1.viva.com or simply email me personally. It's frank at viva.com, V-E-E-V-A.com. Um, the registration is open. Uh, we've got, we're expecting about 100 to 150 people. It should be a really great event. And I should say that also, um, if you want more information on this, mm -hmm. there's also a link underneath the player page no. uh, down there that will link you out to the uh, the homepage for the registration and, and the event information on their site out there. So uh, check that out. And uh, Frank, uh, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Always okay. good to talk to you, Derek. Okay, See have you, a Mike. good event. Have a good weekend. Take care. <laughs> All right, take care. See you, Frank. Thanks. All right. Yeah, it should be a good event. Yep. Yeah, definitely, definitely interesting event there. Okay, well, according to a new survey conducted by business consultants, consultancy firm CEB, the performance and effort now being put forth by U.S. employees are at their lowest level since 2010. Now, CEB is currently part of Gartner, recently acquired, and Gartner, of course, is a leading business advisory company. Uh, we linked out to the research in Tuesday's issue of the Quality Digest newsletter. The report provides uh, several important reasons for this reduced degree of effort um, above and beyond. And that's really what they're talking about here is. So they're not is, talking about people who aren't doing their job. They're no, just, they're, they're not just, talking about slackers. They're just, you, doing, yeah. their, they're just doing, <laughs> they're their doing their job. They're just doing their job, but they're not going above and beyond. <laughs> okay. So there's a couple of reasons why the research talks about this. Um, first of all, there's an impression, and, and maybe true, maybe not, that there are fewer opportunities for workers to grow within their current position. So there's not as much incentive maybe to sure. go above why, and beyond. Why should I work hard? You yeah. can't grow. Yeah. Second, this one I think is certainly true, there's an accelerating gap between compensation for top executives in the average organization and the average worker. That's kind of disincentivizing too. Yep. Third, raises and bonuses have become scarce for many, so it's difficult to justify increased effort for the same or, or maybe even in some cases lower compensation. And finally, many workers have discovered that supreme efforts in the past often led to little or if any reward and recognition from top management. So it's like, well, I'm busting Doing my Doing a home. good job should yeah. be incentive enough. <laughs> you have a job. No, I mean, yeah. you know, it's like, well, you know, it's like at least, yeah. an, at least an out of boy, right? Or an out of right, girl, right, they're not yeah. even getting that. Now, all these things are certainly strong disincentives, as I mentioned, to work harder than necessary. However, there's more going on here as well, and it's really alluded to in the article also. Because another key factor that the CE, CEB Gartner research uncovers is that work-life balance is extremely important to workers today. And no longer do people necessarily look at their job as the chief occupier of their time and energies. Family, leisure time, um, continuing education, right, um, are often priorities too and often higher priorities than work. Um, and the hours that were once devoted to work um, are now devoted to these endeavors, these other endeavors, and they right. gotta come from somewhere, right? right? I mean, more and more the choice on how to spend one's discretionary time is coming down to not work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got, I got yeah. an extra hour. I mean, yeah. I can work on that project that I know is due next week or Ah, I'll wait till Monday. I mean, I got my fantasy baseball. I got to check. That's into. right, you know. Or my daughter has a recital. I mean, it's like, well, you know. Now, maybe that's a good thing. Um, not only for workers, but I, you know, it could be a good thing for organizations too. And the reason why I think that is because people that are engaged in a multitude of activities uh, in their homes, their communities, they're generally a lot more effective if they're chosen. And this is a key word: their chosen career. You choose that work. Right. So when you have a little more flexibility and freedom, you're going to have a little more focus and a little more interest maybe in doing what you've chosen as a career. See, if you're able to make choices, you're more committed to the thing you choose. And I think that's kind of a better result for everybody in the long run and in the short run. I mean, yeah. the idea here is that you're trying to, you are always trying to motivate. We're always trying to have people that are, that are, that are doing the jobs be interested in doing the best job they can. But for many years, there was this idea that, you know, your work life was this amorphous thing that you would always fill more toward if you needed right. more. 
You know, managers would look at workers and say, yeah, it's 40 hours, but the work's got to get done. Right, what are right, you going right. to do? You know, yeah. especially if you're a manager, it's like, well, there's no OT. Yeah. Get her done, right? Yeah. But increasingly, and I don't want to make this a generational thing, but increasingly, I think millennials in particular are saying, no, I want work life balance. You know, right. if my wife's pregnant and going to have a baby next week, I want a couple months off. Right. You know, and increasingly they're able to get it. Yeah. And in this work environment, they allude to this as well. It's a tight work, a tight, light, tight labor market right now. So workers are kind of more in the driver's seat on this yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. So yeah. I think that these are important things to consider. But the idea that you choose the work that you're doing and that the employer chooses you to do that work, there's got to be a meeting of the mind somewhere in the middle where you say, okay, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to do the job. I'm going to do the best I can for you in those hours. But that's it, I get a life too. Right. And I deserve to have that. And people should have that, I think. It's and, better for the organization too. Well, I was just gonna say, so so in the end, you know, happy employee makes better employees. That's so right. I mean, so that's kind of kind of that, there, there's a there's an incentive for the company to do, that, oh, do that kind of stuff. Always, yep. always. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna turn now to our final segment of the show. It's our time for our monthly CMS corner, uh, which comes to you from the Coordinate Metrology Society. And they're one of our very closest strategic partners. Um, the CMS, the Coordinate Metrology Society, that's the place to go for anything that anyone would need to know about three-dimensional industrial measurement. The Society's annual conference, the CMSC, is coming up quickly here in just a few months. I think it's yep. in July in Reno, yep. uh, is, is this year's CMSC. And in this segment, we're chatting with Russell Morrison, who is the Senior Product Specialist at Geodetic Systems, Inc. Russell, thanks for joining us on CMS Corner. Hi, Mike. Hey, Dirk. How are you doing today? I'm great. And you guys? Hey, we're, we're doing we're, we're, we're doing we're, we're doing fine. Good. We're doing fine. Hey, you no, know, uh, Russell, your company uh, GSI uh, mm -hmm. specializes in a in a form of coordinate metrology, uh, which maybe not a lot of people are familiar with. Photogrammetry. A lot of us are familiar with arms and lasers and stuff. But you guys have actually used um, something that's been around for a very long time. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a, bit, a little bit about photogrammetry and why it's important for important uh, in, industrial applications? Sure. Well, um, I guess the, the short answer to that is photogrammetry is the art and science of making reliable measurements from images. And there is a much longer and more eloquent version of that, but that basically sums it up um, in a nutshell. Uh, what we do is we take uh, digital cameras, we take a series of images, we use um, highly automated um, software to use triangulation techniques and that produces, that yields XYZ coordinates. Um, and photogrammetry is used in a whole range of, of different applications and, and it comes in different forms. It's used for, uh, for heritage recording, it's used for um, medical applications, it's it, all kinds of things. But what we focus on is industrial measurement or uh, close range photogrammetry. And primarily those, er uh, those industries are um, aerospace, space technologies, automotive, shipbuilding, um, uh, antenna manufacturing, basically anything that's large and requires um, high precision measurement, uh, characterization or alignment, uh, we tend to get involved in things like that. You know, there's so many great people at, at the Coordinate Metrology Society. We, we've been to that show, Dirk and I, right. for, for a decade and more at this point. Um, and, and you're one of the guys who has just so much experience and so much interesting stuff you've done. You've done a lot of really interesting projects in your career uh, with, with, uh, with GSI and in this industry. Can, can you maybe share with us a couple of the more interesting projects you've done in, in your time? Sure, yeah, I have. I've been very fortunate. and. I think some of those applications have not, I mean, they've been enormously uh, challenging metrology tasks, but sometimes they just get me into really cool places. So I've had the opportunity to work on projects um, like radio telescope projects, and many of them are at um, high elevation, uh, over 18,000 feet in the most extraordinary places like the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. Um, and then there's been other applications that have just been, you know, flat out weird. We get all kinds of uh, calls sometimes and I guess the most famous or infamous of those is the the 4 and 20 pi project which um, that happened at a time I was working many 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 years ago I was working at the geomatics department in um, Melbourne Australia at the University of Melbourne and we were we were contacted by a local pi manufacturer who 
needed to know what the average pi was. And uh, by, term by determining the, the length and the width and the height of a, of a pi, they might be able to um, you know, optimize the packaging and maybe save some money on that. So we were, we were tasked to go and measure all these pies and um, kind of devise a plan to do it. And uh, with some caution thrown to the wind, we, we jumped into this project. It turned out uh, we had to measure 20 different product lines and 1,000 of each. So now we're talking about 20,000 of these pies that needed measurement. Um, it was... Uh, um, a setup where we had like a measurement bay and we had these movable targets that represented those uh, uh, the left, right and upper part of the pie and these parks were pies were parked into this measurement bay and we had overhead cameras that were triggered and we'd automatically um, process the images, uh, output the results, do the conversion to from coordinates to length with height, put it into a spreadsheet. It was all kind of automatic and then the next pies were loaded. It was it was absolute uh, sheer genius <laughs> and, and madness at the same time. And um, did you get free pies a, for life? <laughs> we, actually, we during the process we we did have the opportunity to, to eat some of those pies, and I got to say they they taste much much better straight out of the factory than um, after being in cold, cold storage for a few months. <laughs> But there was one occasion where we were working on a, a at an aerospace company and uh, working on a very large um, tooling fixture, and the phone rang. We got this call that uh, chicken pies were coming off the line, <laughs> and so we, without hesitation, we just down tools. We packed the van. We raced across town and started measuring chicken pies. It was um, the most uniquely um, challenging. Uh, crazy, um, fun project that I've ever worked on. Well, that's great. I mean, they, you can see, Dirk, these guys have achieved a holy grail of, of, of right. pie. They, they've precisely measured pie. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. You guys have achieved it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, we should say they, it's, it's, they, it's they, the, they thought pie was like a, uh, what, what do you call that? A, a, an irrational a, an irrational number. number. <laughs> no, it's, they measured it. They Not measured at all. pie. Not at all. <laughs> well, Russell, um, you know, education and training, uh, important part of, of the CMSC mission, the, the CMS mission, Court of Metrology uh, Society. Uh, mission, um, and and that's really a key thing for bringing people into, especially the education part of that, bringing people into the industry, and and it's it's a graying industry. Let's let's be frank. Um, so bringing people in it really is an important piece of that. So what do you see as some of those factors that will help bring uh, some fresh blood into the industry? Well, I, I think that education um, is really important. I, I think um, that will that will help people see a path into metrology where maybe there wasn't, uh, um, it wasn't so clear. Um, if I look back on my own career, it seems to be a perfectly laid out set of stepping stones um, looking backwards from where I started to get to, um, you know, where I am today in working in photogrammetry. However, when I look forward, it was maybe just a set of um, uh, right choices, uh, opportunities that came along. And so now with that um, metrology certification that uh, CMSC is offering, I think that gives people a path and certainly a look into some of the things that what we do. There's so much development going on with um, both hardware and software, um, things like, you know, the ultra portability of systems, the wearable systems, everyone wants to fly things these days on drones. And um, I think they're doing a good job to promote that um, the field and the metrology is not just a bunch of old guys in lab coats. It's a lot cooler than that. And uh, for those out there who maybe haven't uh, attended a Court of Metrology Society conference, maybe you can give us a quick overview of, of what it's all about. I mean, if you were to go to CMSC for the first time, what kind of conversations would you have? What problems would you solve? And, and maybe as a little sideline of that, you could tell us a little bit about what you guys are going to do in your booth this year. You always have a fun booth with a lot of activity. So maybe a little right. sneak peek wow. at that too. I'll see what I can. Um, I'll see what I can divulge. Um, I, I always encourage people to come to attend CMSC. It is by far the, the one-stop shop, the the opportunity to um, see exactly what we do. That being large-scale metrology using portable measurement systems, um, you'll have the opportunity to meet with expert users that have decades of experience um, sitting on the technical presentations, which unfortunately I never get to see myself because I'm in the booth. Um, and 
and get to cha a chance to talk to you know people like us, equipment manufacturers, and talk directly. And um, it's a gr always a great opportunity for us to meet with our, our customers there. Um, as far as our booth this year, um, we'll have our flagship products. We'll have the Inca camera, the Dynamo cameras, and this year a newly configured version of the D5 system that's uh, highly, highly automated. So we're looking forward to showcasing that. There'll be um, the usual um, fun activities. Some of those are still in planning, so I, you know, we're not sure on some of those things, but there'll be definitely a competition. There will be, um, yeah, a lot of fun. Um, and so we invite you to bring all of your dare and skill into our booth and see how you go. There's always um, there's always some secrecy around what will be the GSI squishy toy each year. <laughs> and um, I gotta say this year is no different. I, I can't really say, unless we had like a, a non-disclosure agreement in place and <laughs> we'd all discuss that. <laughs> But um, yeah, some people we, some people have a huge collection of those squishy toys. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> they do. In fact, just to I, I had them in case the question came up. I got them right here. So here <laughs> is okay, the last twenty years of um, marketing madness. It all started with this guy, the, the rough duck. <laughs> and the from duck. there, it's just gone on. It's it's become almost a cult following for some. <laughs> so. Um, You'll just have to come along to CMSC this year and find out what, what it's going to be. Well, on that note, yes, it's uh, the, the show this year is in Reno, Nevada, uh, in, in middle of July. I believe it starts on July. I think it's July 10th through July 15th this year is, is CMSC. Uh, you can find out more information at www.cmsc.org. And you can also check out Geodetic at geodetic.com. So, Russell Morrison, thanks again for joining us on this week, this month's CMS Corner. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good we'll, to talk we'll, to you. We'll see you in Reno. See Thank, you in Reno. Thanks, That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, a lot of a lot of great equipment. I mean, seriously, if if if, if you're in, whether you use 3D mm. measurement equipment or, or are just interested in it, it's a great show because I mean, seriously, you'll see every kind of 3D measurement technology, <laughs> mostly large scale, but a lot of small scale uh, measurement well, stuff as, and, as well. So and, it's crazy. And it's you know, great stuff. you got that from from a view at Russell. Yeah. I mean, there is this the hall is loaded with people that have unbelievable amount of, of expertise yep. and experience and just knowledge. So I mean, if you come to that show. Uh, and you're in this space, and you have any question at all, even the most off-the-wall question, somebody in that hall will answer your question and for because, you. And because it's a small show, um, you actually get quality time. I mean, you go to a big show like, you know, let's say IMTS or something, yep. you got 50 people in a booth, yeah, yeah. you're not gonna get the kind of attention one-on-one -on -one that you can at these, at these smaller shows. This is a show that's just dedicated through 3D measurement technology, and when you go there, you're going to get quality one-on-one -on -one time with experts in the field. It's, it's yeah. really, and the, the, the white papers and so forth that are presented awesome. are awesome yeah. as well. Awesome. So that is today's show. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Also to, uh, uh, we just saw Russell Morrison mm -hmm. from uh, Geodetic Systems, GSI, and also uh, Frank Defesh from Viva. Be sure to check out Viva's event. The link is underneath the player page there. Click that, go out, see what digital transformation is all about at the Viva event coming up soon. So from all of us here at Quality Digest, have a great week. So long. So long. <laughs>